And that just plays hell with your life if you try to live that schedule on Earth. If you try to live it on Mars, it wouldn't be a big deal. Okay, but trying to live it on Earth can be difficult because, you know, if our daily planning meeting starts at noon today, then the next day it's going to start at 12.39, and the next day at 1.18, and two and a half weeks later you're having your meetings in the middle of the night. And then, and then this, of course, was that I had two rovers, so I had to split my team in half, and everybody's living on Martian time, but in two different Martian time zones. <laughs> and if you're working on one rover and you switch to the other, you get Martian jet lag. So it was, it was, <laughs> it was a very, very bad way to live. We did that for four months, and the team just couldn't take it anymore. And so we've been living on kind of a modified quasi-Earth, quasi-Mars time ever since, where we sort of follow Mars for a while, but once it gets to the point where we're staying up too late, we kind of snap back and wait for Mars to come around and catch up with us. And during that catch-up period, which we call restricted sols, um, what that means is you can't drive every day. You have to plan each day, not on the basis of what happened yesterday, but on the basis of what happened the day before, because you haven't got the data yet. And it's cost us some time, but it sure saved us some sanity. Probably saved a few marriages, too. I think we'll do about three more questions. You, yes, sir. Um, Steve, I wanted to know what you and your wonderful team are going to be doing when the, uh, when the spacecraft finally do die. What are we going to do when the spacecraft die? Well, the short answer to that is we're going to finally start doing all the things that we thought we were going to do <laughs> back before the mission went on so much longer than we expected. Um, but I think the, the, the real thrust of your question is, what's it going to do to us? Okay. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know how I'm going to feel. I have found consistently that trying to predict my emotions, my feelings, how the team would react at various points during the mission, I've been wrong numerous times. For example, at launch. I expected, after all those years of struggle, finally get to the launch pad, send the vehicles off into space. I thought launch was going to be this, this joyful moment where finally it all comes to fruition. And in fact, that's not how I felt at all at launch. And, and a number of my colleagues have said the same thing. At launch, I felt relieved that we finally got them off the ground and NASA couldn't cancel them and JPL couldn't cancel them and so forth. I felt scared because I didn't know if we'd done our jobs well enough. I didn't know if they were really ready to go. And it was hard to say goodbye to them. You know? It was hard to let them go. You'd, I'd worked so closely with these things for so long. Man, you put something on top of a rocket and you shoot at the Mars, it's as it's, it's gone as anything's going to be. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was hard to say goodbye to them. I think that when the rovers die, my expectation, my prediction is we're going to be pretty depressed. We're going to be sort of devastated. It's going to be hard. We've been doing this for so long now. But I could be wrong about that, too. You know, they have, they've done so much more than any of us ever dreamed that it's certainly going to be an honorable death when they die. If they had died young, you know, if Spirit had died on Sol 18 when we thought we'd almost lost the vehicle, um, that would have been devastating. How it's going to feel five and a half, eight and a half, whatever the number is, years into the mission, I don't know. I will be able to get some sleep for a change. <laughs> I should point out that my original script for this film was for the rovers to die dramatically at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that was five years ago. <laughs> right here. How much computing power do you have on board on, on the rovers? How much computing power do we have on the rovers? Our CPU, our processor, was a smoking hot machine in about 1987. <laughs> it runs at a scream in 10 MIPS. Uh, your cell phone is smarter than my rover. <laughs> it's it's uh, C++, and the operating system is VxWorks. VxWorks? Yeah. Blue shirt. What are the key scientific and engineering principles that made the Mars Exploration Rover such a successful program? Wow, what, what are the key, what are the engineering and scientific principles that made the rover mission such a success? Um, on the engineering side, I would say test and test and test and test, okay? On the science side, 
I think the most important thing was as we went through all the tribulations of trying to develop this mission, our science team always had a consistent vision of what we were trying to accomplish scientifically. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of flavor of the week of this scientific discovery and that scientific discovery on Mars, and it's easy to let that pull you off course. We always knew exactly what we wanted to do, and we developed a suite of scientific instruments that worked together as a set to accomplish that job. Um, I think there's one other thing, too, and that was management that didn't flinch. And I have to, you know, I, I, I sometimes speak a little bit disparaging of NASA, but I have to give NASA a hell of a lot of credit. Of credit. And Orlando Figueroa, Ed Weiler, the people at the top of the Mars program when we were developing these missions. We ran into all kind of trouble. Okay, you saw the exploding parachutes and all sorts. It was way worse than that. I mean, the, the, George made it look bad, but believe me, it was, it was, it was even worse. Um, and these guys not only had the guts to keep going when the last two missions had failed, but they had the wisdom to see that unless they gave us more money, we weren't going to make it. We signed in blood at the start of this mission that this thing was going to come in at $688 million. It launched at $800 million. They gave us the money that we needed to get the job done, and we wouldn't have made it without them. So you've got to have some management with some guts as well. Last question. Yes, sir. Right there. This gentleman with the red thing in his neck. <laughs> Loud voice. Okay, how much power do the rovers take? Um, when the rovers are absolutely clean, brand new, straight off the showroom floor, they put out 900 watt hours of power per sol. That's enough energy to run a 100 watt light bulb for nine hours. And that's for everything. That's for driving, that's for taking the data, that's for transmitting the data to Earth, and importantly, that's for running the heaters at night that keep the inside of the vehicle warm enough. Um, the vehicles can are very, very active at 600 watt hours. We can keep them pretty busy at 400 watt hours. You get to about 200 watt hours and they're pretty much just sort of in survival mode. If it gets significantly below 200, you probably lose the vehicles. So that's been about how it goes. But these, I mean, I was making fun of the computer on board, but one of the virtues of that 10 MIPS processor is that it draws very, very little power. And uh, that sure helps when all you got is solar arrays to power you. I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Chris and I have been on the phone a great deal, and I'd like to thank him and his associates for screening my film and Steve's film, and it's a pleasure to be here. I was also given the case for Morris very early in my career as a filmmaker, and um, it's a pleasure to finally meet Dr. Robert Zubrin. I believe that films should speak for themselves, so I'm only going to make a few short remarks here about roving mores. First thing you should pay attention to is Philip Glass's wonderful musical score for the film. We really lucked out, and I think it's one of the best movie scores he's uh, ever done. Secondly, if you listen carefully at the beginning of the movie, the voice of God talking about space is actually Paul Newman. <laughs> and it may indeed have been the last film he ever worked on. Disney assured me, no chance, George, you'll never get Paul Newman. We've been after him for years. But I knew something that tied me to Paul Newman they didn't know. When I was about 25, I worked on, as the press secretary for Paul McCloskey, who ran against Richard Nixon for pre president. My principal job in that campaign was to get and make sure that Paul Newman had a case of St. Pauli girl beer every single day in the back of the car that he was driving in. And I never failed him. He never forgot that. And when Disney could not get his agent on the phone, I called him up and asked him if he would do it, and he said he would.
which is terrific. He came into the sound studio to do the recording. 